Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. We have worked our way to John chapter 2. Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brother, and his disciples. And then we read at the very end of verse 12 that they did not stay there many days. And the reason was because the Passover was at hand. We begin again in John chapter 2, starting this time with verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What signs do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when He was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. An old farmer went to the city one weekend, and when he was there, he attended a big city church. And when he returned home, his wife asked him how it was. Well, said the farmer, it was good, but they did something different. They sang praise courses instead of hymns. Praise courses, asked the wife. What are praise courses? Well, they're sort of like hymns, only different, the farmer answered. Well, what's the difference, asked the wife. Well, it's like this, the farmer replied. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, that would be a hymn. But on the other hand, if I were to say to you, Martha, 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 oh Martha, the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black cows and white cows, the cows, the cows, the cows are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, in the corn, corn, corn. And then if I were to repeat the whole thing two or three times, well, that would be a praise course. Now, as the story goes, on that exact same Sunday, a young man from the city visited the farmer's small country church. And when he returned home, his wife asked him how it was. Well, the young man said it was good, but they did something different. They sang hymns instead of regular songs. Hymns, asked his wife. What are hymns? Well, the young man answered, they're sort of like regular songs, only different. Well, what's the difference, asked the wife. It's like this, the young man said. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, that would be a regular song. If on the other hand, If I were to say to you, O Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my cry, inclinest thine ear to the words of my mouth, turn thou thy whole wondrous ear by and by to the righteous, glorious truth, for the way of the animals, who can explain it? There in their heads is no shadow of sense, hearkenest they not in God's Son or His reign, unless from the sweet, tempting corn they are fenced. Yea, those cows in glad bovine, rebellious delight, have broke free from their shackles, their warm pens eschewed. Then goaded by minions of darkness and night, they all my precious delicious corn did chew. So look to that bright shining day by and by, where all foul corruptions of earth are reborn, where no vicious animals make my soul cry, and I no longer see those foul cows in the corn. Finally, the young man added, Then if I were to sing verses 1, 3, and 4, and change keys on the last verse, that would be a hymn. 
As we enter into the heart of the Gospel of John, we begin to have a much more serious discussion about worship than just the battle of hymns or courses. We start to see that our Lord and Savior begins to show us what faith is and what genuine worship should be. In this passage before us, we have the account of one of the Lord's visits to the temple. The temple itself was to be a place of worship. Worship, by its definition, is an active response to the character, the words, and the actions of God, and whereby the mind is transformed by the Word of God, the heart is renewed with love and trust towards our Savior. And the actions of our lives are surrendered in obedience to Him. But listen, a lot of people think this passage is only about anger from the Lord. This passage is not so much about anger as it is about love. This is a fierce love, a jealous love. It's all about the love of Jesus for the Father and the things that were meant for the Father. And what the Lord truly desires is proper worship of God the Father. We begin again with verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Before we move any further in our text, we need to talk about the timing of this passage. You see, the problem that comes is that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record Jesus cleansing the temple towards the end of his public ministry, during the final Passover week, the week that led to the crucifixion. This is found in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. But here in the Gospel of John, we have this record of the temple being cleansed at the beginning of his ministry. Now, there are two basic ways to solve this problem. One is to say that John was not recording this exactly as the events unfolded in chronological order. The idea behind this view is that basically in the Gospel of John, there is only one record of the temple being cleansed. That this did indeed take place toward the end of Christ's public ministry, but that John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, felt that this was the proper place in this record of events to record the time that Jesus cleansed the temple. Not that this took place early on in the ministry of Christ, but that this is the place in this gospel record that the Spirit of God wanted this event recorded because it helped to develop the flow of thought and to show the type of dead religion that Jesus was up against. The second option is to take this passage in John in its most natural order, that this was, in fact, something that took place in the early days of the ministry of Christ, that this was the first of two different times that the Lord cleansed the temple. Let me tell you why this makes sense to me. The details in this account here in John are different from the other gospel records. Remember, much of what is recorded in the first five chapters of the Gospel of John are events that are not recorded in the other three Gospel records. And so I think that what we have here is a separate event that took place closer to the beginning of the Lord's ministry. This, to me, would seem to be the most natural way of reading the text in John chapter 2. In verse 13, we have our statement. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Remind yourself that the Passover feast was designed to be a time of remembrance of the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt. It was celebrated on the anniversary of that event, on the 14th day of Nisan, also known as Abib. And it was immediately followed by the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which lasted an entire week. The people of Israel living outside the homeland came in great numbers to Jerusalem for this feast. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy 16, where we see the instructions for the Passover. Deuteronomy 16, we'll start with verse 1. And if we understand the preparation of the people for the Passover, it's going to help us to understand some of the hypocrisy that's actually taking place in the temple worship in John. Deuteronomy 16 We'll start with verse 1. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. Notice this next part. 
you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. That you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And take a look at what it records in verse 4. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. Now I want you to think about this. Think about how they would prepare for all of this. Before the Passover, the head of each household would carefully gather up all the leaven in the house and remove it. The people went to great effort to make sure that they had cleaned out their homes, but no one gave a thought to cleaning out the temple of the Lord. Throughout Deuteronomy 16, we see that this was to be a feast of weeks to the Lord your God and a sacred feast to the Lord your God. And then listen to Exodus 12, speaking of the Passover. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service that you shall say? It's the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. Listen to that again, that you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. The people were actually to tell their children that this was the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. But things had become so repulsive that all that John could muster up, all that the Spirit of God inspired him to record, was that this was the Passover of the Jews instead of a feast of Jehovah, as it was intended to be. In many ways, this had become for a lot of the Jews a religious feast, a ritual that they would go through. And I think this statement, the Passover of the Jews, might have also been a reminder by the Apostle John to the Christians that the Passover is not something for the Christians to celebrate because Jesus Christ has become our Passover lamb. Jesus has fulfilled the Passover. And now believers celebrate the sacrifice of Christ, our Passover, by the breaking of the bread on the first day of the week. Notice the subtle wording. At the end of verse 13, back in John, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We talked about this before, that even though Jesus traveled to the south, it is said he went up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was higher up in the mountains. Remember that every male was required to go to Jerusalem three times a year. At the time of the Feast of the Passover, at the time of the Feast of Pentecost, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And think of how far back these feasts went. They were given to Moses even before the tabernacle had been built. Pick up our text starting with verse 14. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. The Lord looked upon the desecration of this place of worship. And remember that the word of God uses two different words for temple. The first word is the word that is used here to refer to the entire temple area. And then there was a second word which referred to the structure itself that contained the holy place and the holy of holies. In this case, it's the entire temple area that roughly made up an area of 19 acres. And as you worked your way in towards the sanctuary itself, you first came across the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of Israel, and the court of the priests. The Jews did not have a lot of love, of course, for the Gentiles, so it is in the court of the Gentiles that they chose to set up shop and do business. What should have been a place of prayer for the nations had been turned into a place to make money. The oxen, sheep, and the doves were the animals that were most often used in offering sacrifices. It could be pigeons or doves for a sin offering if you were poor. 
Otherwise, it was a lamb or a goat. Burnt offerings were oxen. But think of the logistics of it all. If you were traveling to Jerusalem, what would you rather do? Bring a lamb all the way with you or buy one in Jerusalem? At some point, the authorities had decided that it would be convenient to have the court of the Gentiles used for selling the animals needed for sacrifices. It isn't too much of a stretch to believe that the religious leaders received a part of the prophets. A little bit of a kickback. Isn't this how these things worked? The people were allowed to bring to the temple their own animal that they had selected for worship. But by this time, the Jews had added a system that charged the people to inspect the animals. They had a fee that they charged to inspect all the animals brought to the temple for sacrifice. Most of the time, they found the animal blemished in some way, meaning that it could not be used for an offering. This forced those who were traveling from out of town to buy an approved animal at the temple, for often 10 to 20 times the fair market value. At the Passover, hundreds of thousands of Jews, possibly millions, would converge on Jerusalem. The temple had become a business. Every Jewish man, 20 and older throughout the world, also had to pay every year a half a shekel for the upkeep of the temple. The easiest way to pay was when you were in Jerusalem at one of these feasts. The Roman emperor was worshipped by the Gentiles, so there's no way that any Roman coins with his image could be allowed in the temple treasury. Everything had to be paid in Jewish coins, and this meant good, good business for the money changers, and the court of the Gentiles was the place where the money changers had set up shop. It doesn't take us very long to think of the high rates that were charged to change the money into Jewish coins. The Lord's heart was moved at the sight of all this in the temple. The place of prayer for the nation smelled like a barnyard and sounded like a cattle market and the Lord decided to make a clean sweep of this desecration of his father's house. Notice what the Lord did. He made a whip of small cords for driving out the oxen. He turned the tables of the money changers upside down, and he ordered those who sold the doves to take them away. I don't think it took all that long to clear out the place. Jesus told them, Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Jesus was taking on the established religion of men. The issue was that the priests were allowing all this to go on inside the temple, and they were ripping off the people, making a ton of money off them. The Jewish leaders at the temple pretended to be looking out for the people while they filled their pockets with profits that they were making. It breaks my heart, but I must tell you that as I travel, unfortunately, I see this in other churches, and I see this in ministries, especially on the national scene. Behind closed doors, I've seen plenty of men focus on raising money almost as much as they do the work of Christ. It's repulsive. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of good men and women serving the Lord by faith and trusting in Him to provide, but not everything that glitters is gold. And I think much of what is done today is absolutely revolting to Christ. Be careful with what you support. Do your homework. By taking on these groups, Jesus was proclaiming that he was the son of his father in heaven. It was his father's house that they were defiling, and he was taking on the corruption which had long been present in the temple. This all made an impression on the disciples. They remembered the words of Psalm 69, verse 9, which reads exactly as it's recorded here, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Psalm 69 is a messianic psalm which perfectly describes here what the Lord was doing. Not wrath, but zeal because of his love for the Father. When President Teddy Roosevelt was a child, his mother, Mitty, found that he was so afraid of the church they were going to that young Teddy refused to go into the church by himself. He was terrified and afraid of something called the zeal. It crouched in dark corners of the church, ready to pounce upon him. When his mother asked him what a zeal might be, he said he couldn't exactly describe it, but he thought it might be something like an alligator or a dragon. He told his mother that he had heard the pastor of the church read about it in the Bible. His mother got out a concordance and read to him all the passages that contained the word zeal in them. When she read verse 17 of 
chapter 2 here in the Gospel of John. He stopped her. He was all excited as his mother read, zeal for your house has eaten me up because this was the text he had heard that scared him so much. I don't think young Teddy was the only one to ever misunderstand what this passage means. The word for zeal could be translated godly jealousy. And that's how it's actually translated in 2 Corinthians 11. This is righteous jealousy. This is God desiring the worship that he deserves. This is about a fierce love. It's about a jealous love. It's all about Jesus' love for the Father and the things that were meant for the Father. These words, zeal for your house has eaten me up. King David recorded these words hundreds of years before in a prophecy about the Messiah. Zeal does not mean just passion. It means jealousy. And one of the marks of the Messiah would be jealousy for the house of God. This is what the disciples remembered when they saw Jesus clearing the temple. But even though Jesus was filled with passion, there wasn't rage as it would be with men. Jesus was in complete control. A whip was used that he made out of cords, but that was to drive out the animals and to get these depraved men out of there. Jesus was motivated with a jealous love. He was jealous for the Father's dwelling place. He was jealous for the temple to be a place of worship for the Father, not a place to rip off men and women, scamming them of their money. David prophesied that this jealousy would consume the Messiah. It was his passion to see the Father's house to be a place of worship. But this passion for his Father's temple would cost him. It would lead to his death because his actions were a direct threat to the money that would be taken in by the men of religion. Jesus was firing the opening shots in a war with the men of religion in Judea. Pick up our text again with verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 days years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Let's stop for a minute and think about two foundational truths that are taking place in this passage that the people around Jesus did not understand. The first is that the crowd at the temple courts and even the Lord's disciples did not yet understand the idea of the body being a temple. The Jews didn't understand. His disciples didn't even understand at the time. It wasn't until later, until after he had risen from the dead, that they understood and believed the Old Testament scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. The other thing that the people around Jesus did not yet comprehend was the miraculous sign that Jesus would give that he would die and then rise again in three days. If they knew and understood that Jesus was the temple that they would destroy and that he would rise up from the grave, they might have better understood why Jesus cleared the temple. I'm thankful that we can look back and understand these things. Praise God for his great love for us. So think about what took place in verse 18. The Jews said, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? How dare this man interfere? After all, they considered themselves the custodians of the temple and the guardians of the Jewish faith. They wanted to know what right he had. They wanted to know what authority he had for clearing out the temple like he did. Basically, the Jews were telling him, if you are claiming to be the Messiah, you had better back it up. The Lord did give them a sign, didn't he? but not the type of sign they were looking for. They wanted something right in front of them that they could witness, but Jesus would not bow down to the pressures of men. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But these unbelieving Jews didn't understand. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Their focus, as it often is among men of religion, was on the building. But of course, we know the Lord was speaking of his resurrection. It was Herod the Great who started to renovate and rebuild the temple. Herod was a wicked man, but it was good politics. It kept the Jewish people calm. It kept them at bay. 
Herod actually hired 10,000 workers and ordered 1,000 wagons for hauling the stone. Massive construction was taking place when this conversation in John chapter 2 took place. It was completed around 64 AD, and it is said that when it was done, it was so bright in the Mediterranean sun that it actually hurt your eyes to look at it directly. And just six years later, in 70 AD, the temple went up in flames and was destroyed in the Jewish war with Rome. But Jesus wasn't talking about brick and mortar. Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. It took the disciples three more years to understand this. But after the resurrection, they understood Jesus foretold his own death at the hands of the Jewish leaders. When John wrote this epistle later on in his life, Jesus wasn't dead. He wasn't rotting in some tomb. Jesus had risen victorious over the grave. The disciples remembered this from the victory side of the tomb. The disciples were convinced that Christ was alive. It was their firm conviction that he was the fulfillment of Scripture. The way we look at Scripture, the Old and New Testaments, is forever determined by the truth that Jesus Christ lives. Remember, the glory of God never dwelt in this rebuilt temple. But what men did not realize is that the glory of God was standing right in front of them. God was manifesting himself to mankind, just as he had done in the Old Testament. But now it was not in the tabernacle or temple building. It was the Lamb of God. Take a look at our last three verses. There's a powerful lesson taking place, starting in verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The city was jam-packed with Jewish people from all over the world. The Passover was right before the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and during this time many believed in his name when they saw the signs, which he did. John does not list them out, but when in Jerusalem, Jesus performed other signs. And those coming from the reform camp will tell you the meaning of this text is that even though these people believed, it wasn't true faith because it was only based on the miracles of Christ. What do the words of John chapter 20 teach us? The signs of Jesus were recorded. Why? They are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The signs were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John's own words testify that this cannot and doesn't mean that their faith was somehow insufficient. You see, the problem I have with Reformed theology is that it brings works back into the gospel. The very purpose of the signs was to lead men and women to faith, to life. The words believed in, it refers to saving faith. And the consistent usage in the gospel of John of believing in his name, this refers to saving faith. The wording of the text is telling us they observed, they saw, they understood, and they believed that the Messiah of Israel had come. The Bible is much more simple than men make it out to be. You either believe in Christ or you do not. There's no middle ground of believing but not having genuine faith. But then what about verses 24 and 25? Notice the word commit in verse 24, that Jesus did not commit himself to them. It's basically the same word as believed back in verse 23. This is why some translations say that Jesus did not entrust himself to them. You see, there's a play on words in the text. John is telling us the people trusted Jesus, but Jesus didn't trust them. And you have to interpret chapter 2 and chapter 3 together. Nicodemus in chapter 3 is an illustration You see, that's why the end of verse 25 teaches, for he knew what was in man. And then chapter 3 starts out by saying, there was a man. Jesus knew what was in man. There was a man. Notice the play on words. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, we're going to see, he was just like Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple. Every time he is mentioned, he came to Jesus at night. 
There's a simple point here in the text. And it's not that John doubted the faith of these people. They had faith in Christ. They trusted, John tells us, but the Lord did not commit himself to them. Simply meaning he did not have the same type of intimate relationship with them that he had with his disciples. He didn't commit himself to them like he committed himself to the plan of God the Father. Men can be untrustworthy, even believers in Christ. Jesus knew then, and he knows now, the hearts of all men. He knows the nature of man. He can read you like a billboard. And the theme that's being introduced by John was that the fear of persecution by the Jews was so great that many believed but kept their faith to themselves. And that is the contrast that we are expected to pick up from the text. John the Baptist, fierce and open in his witness to Christ, to now men and women who believed but were afraid to be public about their faith in him. So often it is we experience the frustration of learning time after time that those we think we can count on, they fail us, even in the church. But the Lord did not need to learn this lesson, did he? Our Creator knows us better than we know ourselves. There's a book that came out several years ago. It was put out by an anonymous author. The name of the book is The Heart Reader. It's a work of fiction and in no way is meant to reflect a true story. But in this book, the main character wakes up one morning to find himself capable of knowing the emotions of those around him. I mean, this would never happen. But think for a minute what this would be like. It does not take this man very long in the story to wish that he did not have this ability. He immediately becomes aware of the fact that every man and every woman is existing on a level that is completely different on the inside than what would appear on the outside. He hears the pain of the waitress serving him at the restaurant. He's shocked when he hears the fears of the big burly Harley Davidson biker guy. He hears the loneliness of the party animal, and he hears the doubts of the preacher. This man finds himself in a world completely different than the one he thought he lived in. As the story progresses, the man tries to help people, based not on how they present themselves, but on how they are on the inside. The man tries to encourage the waitress. He tries to reassure the fearful biker. He even tries to come alongside the party animal to be a real friend. He makes himself available to listen to the doubts of the preacher. Some respond well to his efforts. Most do not. In fact, most refuse to acknowledge the realities that are inside of them. And they respond by lashing out, walking away, or making fun. God alone knows the heart of man. We tend to put up a strong front for those around us, but God knows what lies within. He knows the pain, the fear, and our own lack of trust. He doesn't want us to be afraid of Him, but we should be honest with Him. The temple of God, it had a purpose. It was to be a place of worship, a place to meet with the Lord. Once Jesus atoned for our sins, the location changed. The place of meeting with God has changed, but His holy standards remain. As Paul testifies in 1 Corinthians 6, believers are now temples to the Lord, and Christ still wants His temple to be pure. The Lord already knows what it is that He wants to drive out of your temple. Allow the Lord to cleanse you. Allow the Lord to work in your life. For you were bought at a price, and therefore Paul teaches, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. After David fell into sin, he cried out to God in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. May this be our prayer this day and every day as we walk with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're listening to this broadcast online, make sure you don't miss another broadcast by subscribing, either in iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on. And if you're listening on iTunes, leave us a review. It helps to let others know that this is a broadcast that is worth listening to.
Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.